Hi, everybody. Uh, we are the Bezark Company. We're located in Los Angeles, and I'm Adam Bezark, the company founder. I'm Lex Rhodes. I'm a creative coordinator. And I'm Vaughn Hannon, the creative technologist. And uh, what we are not is we are not a game developer. We're actually uh, designers and producers of uh, real world attractions. Uh, spectacular rides, shows, and uh, attractions for theme parks, museums, world's fairs, and big immersive experiences. And we've done a number of these, been involved in a lot of high-end projects around the world for folks like Disney and Universal, and for uh, big museum experiences or visitor centers like Kennedy Space Center and Independence Hall in Philadelphia. And the reason we're here today is because even though we're in industries that are really very different, we keep finding that our world of physical experiences and your world of game design are much more closely related than we might have thought or that you may have realized. And that's what we'd like to talk about today, the, the relationship between gaming design and themed entertainment design. Because really, when it comes right down to it, we are all storytelling siblings. We're, uh, we're uh, related closely. We are not identical twins. We're fraternal twins. There are similarities and differences, but that's kind of what we think is interesting to look into today because we think it will be of interest to you guys. So let's start off just by talking about what is it, what do we say when we meet, talk about themed entertainment? What is it? Yeah, and themed entertainment is a, uh, it's a big category. It's not just theme parks. It's not just the, the two big names that we uh, hear a lot. Uh, it includes a whole range of immersive destination-based experiences. Uh, it's about placemaking, it's about transporting the guest, it's about escape, uh, and those things probably sound a little familiar. <laughs> and, uh, and as we'll discuss uh, in a little bit, there are things that are very themed entertainment and there are things that are very video game. And there's this weird land where, where things overlap and you end up with things like escape rooms and arcades with singing mice and pizza. <laughs> um, there's, uh, that said, let's talk about where uh, video games and theme, themed entertain, entertainment have traditionally lived. Yeah, the, uh, many years ago, uh, Michael Eisner, who was then the head of Disney, drew this famous chart that has been used by entertainment designers for decades ever since. He sort of divided the world up into four kinds of entertainment. There is entertainment that, that people uh, consume at home by themselves. There is an entertainment you consume at home socially in a group. And then out in the real world, in, in the outside your home, there are, there's entertainment you consume alone at a destination, such as taking a walk in the forest. And there's uh, entertainment that you consume in a group at a destination. And video games have always tended to occupy those first two squares because they tend to be based out of the home, unless you're at, a, at an arcade. And more and traditionally, theme parks have tended to occupy this sort of bottom right quadrant, the uh, experiences that you have to leave your home for, but that you typically do with friends and family. So we tend to be about making memories with friends and family together. Today, obviously, those lines are blurring, and that's one of the things that we find interesting. Yeah, uh, home alone or otherwise, uh, our two worlds have different strengths and weaknesses. And uh, of course, we all play to our strengths as often as we can, and we also embrace our limitations. Uh, often, we need to get a user from here to there. We know it, they know it. We put them on a track and wish them luck. Uh, <laughs> our job then is to surprise them and uh, to hit them with all the tricks that we have to, to challenge and delight them. And. And that's why we uh, things are we, we want them to be surprising, but they all are they are inevitable. Uh, and along the inevitable paths, among some of the surprises, we're going to make promises to the guests. And uh, storing storytelling and world building is full of surprises and full of promises. And uh, many of them are small and incidental, but some of them are are big, and wet. And the players have expectations. Uh, uh, as our stories unfold, we are obligated to keep our promises. If we build a waterfall, there best be something behind it. By the way, that looks like a, a video game, but that's a real world destination. That is uh, Volcano Bay, Volcano Bay at Universal Florida. Studios, right? 
And it's really interesting to look at the histories of both of these different industries. Uh, a lot of the first theme park designers came from the world of animation. They were very much story first, designing media purely in service of story. And then you look at video games and you see an industry that arose very largely out of technology. And so you'd guess that theme parks would be designed stories first, games would be designed mechanics first, systems first. But everyone in this room knows that it's not quite so simple. Um, you can even just take, for example, the case of two rides, Indiana Jones Adventure and Countdown to Extinction. Uh, for Indy, the Imagineers got to start with this story, this action archaeology adventure, and R&D goes and develops the perfect ride system to tell that story and to hit those emotional goals of, you know, what is Indiana Jones? And so they come up with the um, enhanced motion vehicles, the EMVs, and you know, put those two together, it results in the ride that you know today. But for Countdown to Extinction, it was the other way around. They already had the EMVs and were tasked with skinning that ride system with this new dinosaur story. And it results in a much, a much different ride. These are two industries that have a unique understanding of that interrelation between story and systems and trying to make them play nice together. It's a complicated and squiggly thing where every process is going to have different, or every project is going to have different priorities and demand a slightly different process. So th these worlds are pretty similar, uh, and we have over the years learned a lot from each other, and we've borrowed from each other, and we figure it's not stealing if you're related. It's it's uh, it's learning, and so we we're pretty interested in the things we can learn from the world of game design, and in some cases already have done to adapt ourselves into game design. Uh, we we kind of use this word immersive differently in our world than in game design. Uh, the game world talks about immersive in terms of getting in that flow state where you're so into the game that the rest of the world disappears and you sort of lose yourself in the rhythm of the gameplay. We literally mean immersion in a physical world, right? We mean designing spaces and scenery that creates a new space that is all around you and immersing you in it. Um, and we talk about good show, uh, terms like good show and bad show as being the things that keep you in that story or break the story for you. Uh, if, it's, if it's bad show, if, the, if a, uh, a trash can looks too modern, if you're in a period location. Those are things you guys deal with as well, uh, but we have to deal with it in a physical world and move stuff around until it works. Um, and in our world, immersion goes a long ways back. You know, Disney has been building immersion for decades. The Haunted Mansion ride, one of our favorite rides, was built over 50 years ago. And it created, it used a vehicle system that very carefully points each viewer at exactly what the, the designers want you to see. It functions as a movie camera in their eyes, but you could argue that it was arguably the, the very first ever first person, per, first person camera controller, as if it was a game. Uh, and in, you know, in modern gameplay, we use sticks to control our body and head motion. Disney was doing it with egg-shaped vehicles 50 years ago. And land design and level design are very similar in many ways. They're all about providing environmental cues that support the story and provide tools for implicit navigation throughout. Uh, here I pulled up maps of New Orleans Square at Disneyland and the Isle of Armor from Pokemon Sword and Shield. <laughs> These make a nice comparison because they're both like relatively self-contained uh, spaces but freely explorable in 3D space. So when you make a land or a level for that matter, you always start with your main path. Uh, the purpose of this is to connect the major set pieces of the area. Uh, it's a relatively quick and expedient way of getting through the space but it's also highly scenic since you have a lot of control, uh, really tight control over the sight lines in this path. Then of course you have these ancillary uh, detour paths that reward curiosity, allow you to investigate fun little nooks and cubbies just off of the main path. Uh, these paths let you stray a little bit, get a little bit lost, but they almost always, you can see here, they almost always loop back to the familiar, to the main path rather than, uh, you know, get you too uncomfortable. It's all about striking that perfect amount, just the right amount of discomfort um, so that it feels exciting and adventurous. We, we sometimes talk about the idea of getting safely lost, right? Yeah. You want to get just lost enough to get excited, but know you can always find your way back. And then even in these examples, you can see they both have uh, fast travel options. You've got the Disneyland Railroad, you've got the train, you've got flying options, and you have uh, completely alternative locomotion options where you can actually take to the seas, 
cross the water and pursue those far off landmarks. There's another intuitive uh, navigation tool that theme park <laughs> designers specifically have a goofy word for, and that's, that's weenies. Uh, a weenie is a large eye-catching set piece, something like Sleeping Beauty Castle, that's visible from a great distance away and it draws people through a space. Um, Walt Disney coined the term uh, describing how you know you can guide guests through space in the same way that he would lure his pet poodle from one room to the other with a hot dog. So if you've ever thought to yourself, wow, theme parks seem to have a lot of giant fake mountains in them, it's because they're excellent weenies. Uh, they're also really popular in games, partially uh, for their use as a navigational tool, right. but also because that triangular shape is really excellent at concealing far off landmarks and then slowly revealing them as you move around the base of the mountain, which mm -hmm. is really fun. So this kind of connection between placemaking and gameplay goes way, way, way back. Uh, if you go back as far as uh, the 1893 Chicago World's Fair, the World's Columbian Exposition, one of the great uh, sort of uh, created events in, in American history. Uh, it was a, a, a world of different places from the, from the very elegant to the very sort of folksy, but it also included some of the very first carnival games where you could actually step right up and, and take your chances and try and win a, win a, a Cupid doll. And over the years, theme parks have picked that up more and more. Our, the very first bits of gameplay in theme park design started in the, uh, arguably in the 90s, I guess you could say. Disney did a terrific experiment in the 90s of a freestanding game uh, location called Disney Quest that was filled with both off-the-shelf games but also original games that they spent millions designing and then after building two of them, never built another one. Um, but it led to a lot of other development in, in the sort of crossing over between game and theme parks. So in the theme park world, uh, Disney installed a, 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 a drive-through shooting gallery. Disney installed, created a, an attraction shooting gallery Buzz Lightyear's Astro Blasters, where you fired at little little green men, and uh, since then others have followed suit. Uh, the Six Flags parks have their Justice League Battle for Metropolis, which are very elaborate, where there's a combination of live media around you and shooting gallery. And just this month it, at Disney's California Adventure, the new Avengers Campus has an attraction called Web Slingers where you can fly with Spider-Man and uh, without even any weapon in your hand, you can just use your hands to shoot webs at little robots that you're trying to catch. Uh, this kind of storytelling has broadened out and gameplay has taken on many different forms now in theme parks. Uh, what, and these are using storytelling techniques from the world of RPGs and tabletop games. Um, we're starting to see character-based storylines and quests that you can actually play as a guest in a park by interacting either with the environment or with live actors who are in character who are there for you to, to play with and talk to. Uh, Evermore Park in Utah is amazing. It's essentially an entire theme park that is a big D&D &D LARP game where you can take on a character, go on quests, meet wizards, and have experiences uh, and challenges all day long and come back and they'll remember who you are and you can continue the quest you started the last time. These things aren't rides. These are real living worlds with and story worlds where guests can have real agency and real input in the world, really change and, and really have it make a difference. And some of the very biggest theme parks, Disney and Universal, are now starting to include gaming layers that are deeply woven into the, the, the design of the entire land, where that actually affects the architecture and the rides and the pieces of the land, where you have special apps that you control or a wristband that you can you let you play and interact with the land. And, and when you we're doing that in big theme parks, it's hap it has to happen at very high scale because you're handling tens of thousands of people a day through these things. So one of the big challenges is trying to figure out how to weave these into rides and live performance and these app layers and these little mini games that we go through. And it's not easy. So one of the things that we keep asking is, how can we make it even better? How can we steal more from each other and learn how to improve what we do by studying what you do and vice versa? Yeah, and earlier we alluded to the strengths and weaknesses in uh, 
in both of our industries, themed entertainment and video game design. Uh, you know, uh, the big weaknesses for uh, in our world happen to be some of the best strengths in the video game world. Mm -hmm. uh, we, you know, we have a bunch of people together so we can do big spectacles and uh, multi-sensory uh, experiences and they're highly social because everybody's in the same space. Um, but it's really hard to do those individualized experiences, uh, uh, maintain persistence and progression and guest agency when you have to worry about things like Adam was saying, throughput and getting you know, a million people through, uh, through a space in an hour. Um, and because that's what, it, that's what it boils down to in these, these physical spaces is throughput, throughput, throughput. Like how, how do we get all these people through and how do we get as many people into the experience as possible? Um, so how do you, uh, you know, is it possible to, to individualize those experiences? Uh, there's, there's been attempts with VR and those, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> those offer very real headaches and also very, uh, -huh. uh operational headaches. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, they, they actually don't individualize that experience, the experience all that much. Everybody's kind of doing the same thing, uh, in a VR coaster, for example, for example, you're all having the same experience. It might feel like it's individual to you, uh, but everybody's experiencing the exact same thing. Uh, the uh, one of the best examples that uh, that I think provided individualization was uh, Alien Encounter in uh, Disney World uh, in the Magic Kingdom, where you were in a theater, uh, a round theater, and uh, if you haven't been on it, an alien shows up, gets loose, and then everybody has the experience of this alien's running around and it feels like it's right behind you. It's of course right behind everybody. You're all having that same experience again. Uh, but it feels very individual and, and extra terrifying. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, in that case, it was put everybody in the dark and just use audio and then <laughs> and, and shake their seats a little bit and then you can, uh, you can have that experience. But it's a, it's a big challenge to, uh, to individualize an experience in a, in a place like a theme park or other destination. Uh, and I don't think we have it perfectly solved yet. Uh, you know, I think there's room for doing some more, uh, uh, exploring uh, guest versus guest type oh, of experiences yeah. where, you know, things can be truly random. Even in a video game, things aren't truly, you know, you have a very similar experience. Oh, I, I did this, I did this, I wanted this quest, I ran into this person and I fought this boss. Um, oversimplified, but this is kind of the same thing, right? We were like, oh yeah, I did that. And this is how it went for me. Um, so things get truly random when you get into MMOs and you get other humans involved. And now you're like, oh, this last night, this crazy thing happened because so-and-so did this to me and, uh, or challenged me to something. And uh, now you have all these new experiences that pop up that not everybody can have. And then it's truly individual. And uh, uh, I think we can get there. <laughs> <laughs> and then you've got other challenges like, uh, like persistence. Like in a video game, you, you literally have a save file. Your progress is saved. Your individual impact on the world, whether you're building things or destroying things, that data gets stored and it carries over to the next time you visit that world. But in a park, it's really hard to feel like you have an impact or a mark on that world, whether it's just in terms of story or literal environment, because it has to be scrubbed clean for the next guest. Everyone is expecting the same experience. And so uh, it's really hard to figure out where are opportunities to, to give guests that feeling of persistence. Um, Knott's Berry Farm has a seasonal immersive experience called Ghost Town Alive, where one of the th really cool things that they do is they print an hourly newspaper. Oh yeah. So as guests, you know, they go on adventures, they have escapades throughout the area. Those are recorded, um, you know, whether good or bad, whether you're a hero or a bandit, those are going to get recorded in the newspaper. And that's kind of, at least over the course of a day, maybe we could go for a longer time period in future experiences, but over the course of that day, you do see your impact on the world and it's, it's physically recorded um, in that space, which you is You get to see cool. your name in the paper and take that home with you. Right? Yeah, and it's a great souvenir too. Yeah, yeah and along those lines with persistence, uh, it's, it's kind of the same thing as how do you track progression for, for individuals in, in a park experience or in a, a location-based experience. Um, it's uh, a lot of times, you know, uh, folks will want to say that they want to gamify an experience, and uh, I think a lot of us are like, oh, <laughs> oh <laughs> right. no. <laughs> another shooting gallery. Right, right. another shooting gallery. That's it. Uh, and, you know, they, they, uh, they want all of the things from a, the, the video game world, but they, uh, then they realize how tricky that is and all those challenges that, we've, that we're talking about, and then they're like, oh, never mind, let's just make a shooting gallery. <laughs> um, so uh, progression is is also part of individualization where you you want to be able to track your 
your score. You want to be able to track your, your progress through whatever experiences you're having in the park. And um, it's, uh, it's starting to happen. Uh, you know, it happened a little bit when Disney did Virtual Magic Kingdom. Uh, that opened in 2005. Uh, it was an online, online thing. Feels like a million years ago. Uh, but you could go to the parks and, and actually uh, fulfill quests that you would then give you digital goods in the Virtual Magic Kingdom. Mm -hmm. So uh, you had a little bit of, of it was a little bit of individualization, a little bit of progression, uh, and you, you could go back and do another quest and, and get more stuff. And then, then those things were, those digital goods were only available to people who had done the things in the park. So you couldn't get them any other way, which is great. Uh, Super Nintendo World just opened in uh, Universal in Osaka. Yeah. Uh, and they built a, uh, a secret game that you can only get to if you complete, uh, if you find the five keys throughout the rest of the world. Uh, and they have, uh, it's a watch based or a watch like uh, wristband, wristband thing, thing uh, that keeps track of your progression so you know who got the five keys and you have, you have to unlock the cue to this uh, attraction by tapping your wrist. Uh, and then you can play the game that nobody else can play unless they've completed the thing. So there's a little bit, a little bit happening there. Uh, uh, being able to track your progress and do things and and then uh, Disney again also did uh, of course with Galaxy's Edge uh, you can use the app to sort of uh, uh, start creating a little bit of a character for yourself and tracking your progress as that character and choose choose a side uh, or be a scoundrel which is the most fun and <laughs> uh, and you know they've integrated that into the land really nicely so that there's multiple things to do. Uh, the attractions uh, also tie into the into the game and into the app. Uh, so this stuff is starting to happen. It just it's but it's still a challenge. It's still tricky to uh, provide this on a, on a, the scale necessary for a park. Yeah. So I think one of the questions that we struggle with in the theme park world is we always want everybody to have a great time. Games are all about failing your way to success. So just like real life. <laughs> right? So is it, do you think it's possible for us to get to a place where there can be failure in a theme park? Or is that going to make little kids cry and parents unhappy? Yeah, it's a really interesting question because failure can play so many different roles in games. Um, there's, you know, using failure as uh, stakes. When you play a game, when you're engaging with a game, you're kind of investing time and energy in the name advancement and progress and failure kind of reclaims some of that progress and resets you a little bit. The, if you want to call it the threat of failure, kind of uh, adds a lot of tension and suspense to a gameplay experience. Mm -hmm. There's also uh, failure as a proving ground. The idea that the harder something is to achieve, the better it's going to feel when you ultimately do win after all those different attempts. There's a uh, failure as comedy. Failure can actually be really funny, especially if you can create an environment where guests or players, they aren't shamed for messing up but they're actually applauded if you can reinforce that failure can be really funny and on top of all of that failure can just be narratively interesting if you make sure that you provide interesting narrative content whether someone succeeds or fails you know there's just as much uh, story to find at either end then that's just a that's just branching narrative and those are just two different interesting options that people can pursue and obviously some of these uh, different uses of failure are more applicable to a parks environment than others. Really, it comes down to a problem of crowds and a problem of lines. Because when you don't have that instant reset, uh, it, it makes it harder for it to be fun to kind of retackle that challenge after, after suffering a failure. Yeah, and failure is part of one of the other big challenges that we have, which is guest agency. Giving, giving guests true choices and true freedoms to do right. things that, and that affect their experiences and and also like the other things we've been talking about uh, persistence and progression. Um, so you know, giving users a choice makes a great experience, but we're limited by annoying things like physics in, <laughs> in how much we can do. <laughs> Curse you, laws of right? physics, right? That's uh, so we haven't found our way around that yet. Uh, we're working on it. Um, you know, our best efforts so far are kind of the illusion of agency, not not real guest agency or not real player agency like you would have in a game. Um, uh, the, like the wands in Diagon Alley, uh, you you feel like you, the individual, are having this experience, and you're you. I'm sorry, the wizard. You, the wizard, are having this experience and, and causing uh, something to happen, but uh, it's you and the twenty wizards <laughs> waiting in line behind That's, you, watching the other wizard to work you, magic, and then you they, wait for your turn to they, do the exact exactly same. Exactly right. Magic. Yes, right. and then so that kind of takes the a little bit of the magic out of it, and uh, you know they. 
it's it it's you choosing to affect the environment, but it's a very prefab uh, version of guest agency. Right, and what in a single player game environment would be like a delightful little surprise that you stumble upon is now, it's not much different than a carnival game that you wait in line for. Right, exactly. So the, we could go on about this stuff all day, but the, the other thing that we really wanted to cover with you guys is the, is the connections, the professional connections between our world that there's an awful lot of crossover between our business and the game design business. We hire game designers all the time to be part of our design teams because we feel, as Lex said, that if you know how to design a game level, you pretty much know how to design a land in a theme park with a few adjustments. So it's really worth knowing about it. So let's talk a little bit about professional opportunities that game designers can find in our world of physical experiences. Yeah, my, my first job before working at the Bizarre Company was actually in the games industry. And the day-to-day -day skills that you find yourself using in either industry, in either job, are remarkably similar. Uh, things from working with custom story technology, uh, creating responsive and interactive worlds, communicating with sometimes huge multidisciplinary teams, uh, understanding guest flow as it pertains to emergent and environmental storytelling, just creating a backdrop for people to make their own characters and make their own stories. And obviously it varies depending on your discipline, but um, yet your skills are, are more transferable than you might think as a game designer who might be interested in the world of themed entertainment. And to be honest, a lot of uh, modern media-based theme park rides, are they're, they're using the game engines that you're familiar with. They're using Unity, they're using Unreal. And in addition, a lot now have app layers, companion apps that we were talking about where, um, yeah, they just, they need game developers. It's, it's the craft you already know, just in a theme park environment. And one of the things that you may not know if you haven't really looked into this industry is it's more than just the mouse, right? It's more than just Disney. Disney w certainly created the, the themed entertainment industry as we know it. Then along came Universal over the years and other large companies have done it. But what people don't necessarily realize is that that has led to a, a broad expansion of sort of immersive theme park like experiences in other places around the world so we've worked on things for epcot big fireworks shows for epcot but we've also created worked on uh space shuttle atlantis at, at kennedy space center we've been able to create immersive uh halloween parties for the white house we've worked with ex helping uh, theme parks in Asia and the Middle East, expanding their ideas. We've worked with the Lego theme parks who, who are learning to tell the story of how to make a plastic brick into something fun that you want to hang out with and play all day and experience. So there are a lot of these different opportunities growing. And not just opportunities, but companies. Right, yeah, there's there's a, a lot of folks involved. Uh, it's, you know, as we said, it, it's, it's more than theme parks. Uh, and it's more than the, the, the two big names that everybody thinks of when you think of theme parks. And as with any creative endeavor, uh, there are multiple parties who are all working together to make everything happen. Designers, technicians, programmers, artists, writers, and uh, yes, even managers are needed for <laughs> <laughs> to make these things happen. Uh, somebody has to organize the, the whole thing. Uh, there's, there's so many different little, uh, uh, little and big companies uh, involved in the many of the attractions that you've been on. Uh, and or shows that you've seen or museums that you visited that you don't you know you may not necessarily think about who who did all the things and who thought about how it all came together and there are also a couple of uh, large uh, professional trade organizations for our industry there's the IAAPA which holds a huge conference every year in Orlando of course the where it's 30 to 50,000 professionals come together. You can learn a lot about our industry in that, uh, that big uh, conference, and they have other ones around the world. And the Themed Entertainment Association, the TEA, is designed literally for companies like us who are the creators and designers of theme parks, and it involves career advice and workshops and behind the scenes tours and a lot of professional networking. So it's a great way, if you're interested in learning about this business, you can. And, and I think our takeaway here is that this business, this world of immersive experiences, is something that game designers are, would be well advised to pay attention to for a couple of reasons. One is, uh, 
you may find that this is a nice little side hustle for you. That if you're a professional game designer, you may find yourself tagged, as we sometimes do, being brought in to help design a level or, or add to the gameplay in an attraction or otherwise advise or help out with an attraction. You also may find it's, a, it's an industry that you really want to stay in because it's a really fun, interesting industry full of curious Renaissance people who know about everything from animatronics to magic to architecture to graphics and people who come into this world often find they don't want to leave. But another reason you, you would be well advised to start learning about our world is because you as a game designer may find someday that your game is being adapted into a theme park attraction or experience and when that happens you'll want to know some of the rules of the road so that you can help the people adapting your attraction make it the best it can be. So this is what we wanted to, you to understand, uh, that as storytelling siblings, you should know about us. This could be a fun little side hustle for you. You might end up with a whole career in, a, a, a the, in theme parks, or you might end up licensing your game to an attraction. And we think that's well worth looking into. But the, that's not the end of our, of our presentation today. <laughs> Uh, this is our false ending. Like any good ride or any good game, we have a surprise ending, the boss level. And let's take you there right now. And here we are. Our surprise is we are going to undertake a little demonstration of how we work on these sort of things by, by uh, putting together a, a sort of a sample brainstorming session or a charrette, as we love to call it in the theme park business, uh, where we will demonstrate how we sort of work with a game developer to sort of tease out the very first ideas about how to create an attraction based on a great gaming IP. And we're also being joined by our senior creative director, Baz. Hi. Who is the only person who's actually at our office today. <laughs> and, uh, and we have brought with us, we're very excited to welcome a special guest from one of our very favorite game companies who we've worked with in the past from Ubisoft. Please welcome our pal, Mathilde Bresson. Mathilde, you want to come up? To Hi, me? everyone. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. So you want to say uh, a little bit high about what your role is at Ubisoft? Sure, my pleasure. Um, so I have been with Ubisoft for the last six years at different roles. And right now, um, my responsibility is to help Ubisoft grow in the world of location-based entertainment or themed entertainment. So essentially theme parks, family entertainment centers, other types of attractions and experiences. So it's about finding the right partners for Ubisoft to lean on in the physical world. So theme park operators, developers, owners, and the right creative partners as well, which these are Adam and the team. You know, we've worked, we've done some work together in the past in our, um, you know, good friends. And, and I think, uh, you know, good creative uh, collaboration. And, and so that's, um, that's kind of how we bring our brands to the world of theme parks and theme entertainment. Uh, before we start, this is a disclaimer for all game designers and fans out there. We are not designing a real Ubisoft ride. We're going to design a pretend one today. So today we're going to do a, a Zoom charrette brainstorm and we've brought our handy dandy whiteboard. We will talk about a couple of different things today. We will talk about, you know, sort of the, the type of attraction we want to create. We'll work with Matilda in picking what uh, IP game we want to go with and then try to figure out some ideas about how to get it there. Our hypothetical theme park developer will say has told us that they're developing a, a big major new theme park on the scale. Let's say it's on the really big scale, like a Disney or a Universal type park, very big high budget, big spectacular thing. So anything goes, they're open to any idea. Since you are the uh, the IP holder today, we're gonna let you pick which one do you think mm -hmm. we should make our game or, or make our ride around today. We're talking, you know, big ambitious uh, project, Universal or Disney scale. Um, I would love to go with Assassin's Creed. Yes. Um, we love it. Plus, I think I had Assassin's Creed in the in the betting pool, so that I win. What is the heart and soul of Assassin's Creed? So tell us what you know about the property that you think is just important sure. for us to understand about the game, and then we'll talk about how it can be physicalized. 
Sure. I think if you don't mind, I'd, I'd love to share, you know, a few visuals, a few slides. Yeah. You guys to... Great. So, you know, as I was saying, it's, it's not only one of Ubisoft's most popular IPs, so it's very commercially, it's, it has a lot of success, but it's also an incredibly rich uh, creative universe and, and one that for me is, is perfectly fit for the theme entertainment industry. Um, you know, at its core, Assassin's Creed is about um, immersing people in history and giving them the tools to create their own epic adventures within it. So it's has a very strong sense of place. You're experiencing all those um, you know, incredibly historically accurate past environments to explore the city, to create your own story and an and epic adventure. And I think that is a very something that translates very nicely. Um, so very quickly, going back to some of the key story pillars, Assassin's Creed is about an ancient war that two factions have been fighting over centuries and centuries. And on the one hand, you've got the Templars that are a monastic turned military order turned corporate giant um, that are essentially convinced that um, order and control is to be valued um, over freedom of you know, the individuals. Um, and on the other hand, you've got the assassins that are a, a rebel faction, a brotherhood that think that progress is brought about um, by free will. So those two factions have been fighting over centuries and the Templars in present day, so the corporate giant uh, that now the Templars have taken the form of, which is a company called Abstergo Industries, created a machine called the Animus. And the Animus is, has the power to read people's genetic memory by reading a blood sample and displaying moments of life of their ancestors in present day in real life. Um, and so they created that technology because they were looking for an ancient artifact called the Apple of Eden that had the power of imposing their vision of control and order on the world. And so they're looking in present day um, for the descendant of the person who hid that Apple of Eden uh, centuries and centuries ago. So it is thanks to that machine the animus that we are traveling from present to past, um, which also I think is something interesting for us to keep in mind. Could the animus be some sort of portal? You know, what does it look like in real life? How do we transition from present day theme park, wherever we are, to, you know, the past Assassin's Creed world? It is thanks to the animus, again, that we have been exploring all those key moments in history, you know, going from Italy during the, the Renaissance to, um, 18th century Caribbean and the golden age of piracy to the French revolution in Paris to ancient Egypt. And now more recently Britain during the, the Vikings invasion. So really what is key to the brand is being able to explore all those key moments in human history. And, you know, we could build around a new one that hasn't been explored yet in the game. So that's something that, that we could For our attraction. You mean? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And that could be also something very interesting because then gamers who have been immersed in, this or that world at home are going to get to experience something new in the themed entertainment world. Um, now, there are a few things, uh, a few keywords uh, that I think reflect very well what the essence of the brand is that I think I'd like us to use as guidelines today or guiding principles. Yes. Um, uh, and the number one thing is that it's a brand that's cunning, uh, meaning it's physically, but also very um, intellectually stimulating. Um, becoming a master assassin is about you know, mastering the art of uh, concealing your intentions, of deciphering clues, of, uh, you know, being fast and precise in movement and action. It's just majestic. So there's there's something very elegant and very uh, and very cunning within the brand that, if, you know, we should keep in mind. That's beautiful. It's a brand that's epic. Um, Assassin's Creed is about, you know, allowing people to live adventures that are larger than life, uh, meeting iconic characters and and being a part of you know those big events, turning points in history, and it's you know whatever experience we're going to design, it has to have that epicness to it. Uh, it's a brand that's very much about exploration. You know, we're giving you those open world, past environments for you to explore horizontally and vertically. Uh, whether it's buildings or here, it's a it's a cliff or you know a, a boat mat. Assassin's Creed is about exploring what's around you, um, looking at what's around you, and and then just getting the chance to go through a window or jump from balcony to another, parkouring across cities, have different points of views on the world that we're giving you um, to, to experience. So that's 
escapism and exploration are very also very key to the brand. And then the environments that we're creating with this brand are incredibly historically accurate and authentic. It's an entertainment experience, but it's also an educational experience in the end. Um, we've had teachers telling their you know, kids in high school to play Assassin's Creed just to get immersed in Paris during the French Revolution. It's We really spend a lot, a lot of time and effort trying to recreate the most accurate and historically accurate um, uh, cities in the world. And whatever we design, if we use a character from history or ref- refer to an event that truly happened, we have to make sure that we, you know, we, we do that in a very authentic way. With this brand, we're essentially filling the blanks of human history, uh, you know, taking what is known and creating around, building around it, building a story, sorry, around it. And then, um, and then finally, uh, one of the last attributes, you know, last but not least, it's, it's a brand that's about belonging to a fraternal clan um, and fighting for the greater good. Uh, so it's a brand that's very idealist, that's very optimistic. So it has a, a very positive impact on whoever is 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 playing the game. And I also think that that's something we should um, aim for as a takeaway for anyone who's going through the Assassin's Creed experience in a theme park. In an attraction. What, what, one of the things we've been doing while you were talking, we started mm. capturing some of these uh, the key words as you're going just to get... The stuff that gets us excited. Ooh, who wrote that? Verticality equals freedom. That's right. You really do get to <laughs> fly like an eagle, right? Let's push over here a little bit and we can talk some more about what are some of the things that uh, that make the game fun? What are the what are the pieces of gameplay that like you would really feel like you have to experience for it to in the real world for it to feel mm. like it's a like it's a really an Assassin's Creed experience? You know, to me, what makes it really, really perfect for themed entertainment and for designing what we want to design today is is really the exploration aspect. You know, when we do um, studies of what people like to do within the game, explore the open world is you know always come comes back as you know first or second um, motivator. Um, then there, of course, the leap of faith. Uh, the leap of faith is really a really one of them. Um, that's sort of the emotional high point of the game, yeah. isn't it? That, 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 that's, that's the payoff. And that's something we can't really, really do in real life. So how, you know, is there a way that we could translate this in the physical world in the theme park yeah. experience? Right. Well, why not? That, you know, here are the main things that you do in the game that you love, right? You run roof, you run mm. across rooftops, you're leaping parkour style. You're getting to do that incredible leap where you fall 500 feet into a into a conveniently placed haystack, right? The uh, and um, the I mean, you could do it as a coaster, you know, as a as a coaster ride. Coasters are interesting uh, because they're super thrilling. They have real, genuine physical thrills. You're actually being mm-hmm. hurled around at high speed. The the sort of downside to a a, a coaster is. It's got a big vehicle and a big track and you see where you're going. There's no surprises in a coaster because the track is showing you exactly where you're about to go. So you can have amazing drops, but it's sort of hard to bury the track in the in historic mm. revolutionary France. So we could you certainly could do it, but I wonder if there's other ways we can get there. One of our rules in these brainstorms is there's no bad ideas. So if you guys like a coaster, mm. but Go for yeah. a coaster. Let's just throw out different possibilities. But I, but it, it seems like there may be other interesting sort of more theatrical ways to give you that real sense of dropping, come of dropping and climbing and leaping and traveling. And it's also not physically engaged in the same way. So is there, you know, is there something in between? Also, coasters tend to be big group experiences because you've got 20 or 30 people on a coaster. I wonder if we can make this feel like a smaller experience where it's just one person at a time or just a couple of people at a, at a time. We are running into our uh, two of our big challenges, right, which is guest agency and individualization. These are things and how that do we, theme parks and how do we, really <laughs> that we don't do well. Right. So, uh, yeah, this is going to get interesting to see how we can make this work. Uh, Especially adapting a game IP that's already interactive and already Mm. satisfies that promise. You know, you just don't want to, in adapting it to a real world experience, the last thing you want to do is have it fall short of something that you can already have at home. The leap of faith and parkouring 
both are iconic. If we don't incorporate those in some way, we're not delivering on guest expectations. You can look at, say, what uh, Shanghai did, Shanghai Disney did with their challenge trail. Oh, um, that is cool. Does anybody have some pictures of that? Lex, can you find that? Yeah, I actually yeah, have one over on the other side of the whiteboard. I'll grab them. All right, hang on. Bring it over. Let's talk about that for a second, because that is one of the one of the most engaging experiences we've seen in a while. It's basically like a, a, a rock climbing course, but done in a Disney way. So it's it's safe. Mm -hmm. It 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 ensures success, but it gives people. It doesn't really fake the uh, the process of like scaling a mountain. It just does it in a nice protected and you know borderline organized way. There's still there's still choice involved that you can like switch from a, a an easy track to a difficult track at certain checkpoints. Um, there it is. That's a, a nice picture of it. So you certainly could start with something like that. You could start with a city and let people climb over it in this harnessed way, but sort of find ways maybe even to go inside and outside of buildings or mm -hmm. climb over stuff. Um, and yeah, that would be that would be really fun. And I, what I like about it yeah. too is it's it can become sort of systemic it's not a linear experience you can you know depending on the challenges you can choose the hard path the medium path the easy path and then this way the experience that you're going to live through it is never going to be the same uh you know there's a replayability um repeatability with that yeah. idea uh that i like very much that's very uh you know it's it's pretty interesting uh so that's certainly one way we could come at it it's it's uh it's weird. It's elaborate, but it's low tech. It's not super high tech. There's no, that particular version is outdoors. There's no film or media or special effects involved. What you see is what you get, right? You're actually cl climbing real rocks and things. We might be able to take that to another level. We might be able to go into indoor spaces where there's lighting and special effects. So you could have uh, more, you, you could add, uh, people Warriors. coming at you, warriors coming at you in projection around you and, and so on to make it more theatrical and dynamic. We could we could try some of that. Or maybe uh, you're, it, could, uh, it could be so fun to have um, to have live performers in full costume as these characters, mm -hmm. like trained stunt performers that you can do little time trials and challenges against where yeah. either they're teaching you how to do it or yeah, you're challenging them to, you know, see who can get to the end faster. And by the way, we're breaking about 50 theme park rules right now, but I really like it. So like, uh, you almost never see live performers in an attraction because they're considered too expensive, honestly. But I don't think that's necessarily true. I think we could find ways to work within that, that you can, if you can make an experience that really is powerful, that really has some great live performance. We can, we can do some pretty great stuff with media where, you know, You've got a doorway and there's a, you know, a, a Templar on the other side of the doorway and they can be pretty believable looking. This one is wearing a very attractive dress, I see. But they can be, you know, you're, you can be on one side of it on your challenge trail and these Templars and, and threats can be appearing in, <laughs> I'm trying this really well, can be appearing, you know, in, in portals or windows that yeah. let us see people just outside who are coming after us. We can do a lot of stuff with um, with dimensional uh, uh, projection on uh, on trans screen or Pepper's Ghost that makes it look like they're really in the space with you, so that when we do need a, a real live person, it's almost indistinguishable from the ones who are part of the media, and you can really mix it up in a really interesting way. There's, the thing we're always saying uh, is, you know, you want to design things that are fun to play, but also fun to watch. And so if you have, if you're able to incorporate them in a way that kind of creates a show, not only for the people, you know, going through the attraction, but also for people down below on the path who are watching this unfold. So yeah. this actually gives me an idea that I think our creative technologist is going to hate me for. <laughs> um, but I think it's worth mentioning. So, uh, you know, Assassin's Creed is about being slow when you have to, but being like magically swift and agile when you need to. And then I think about some of the stuff I've seen at IAPA the past couple of years where uh, some people are incorporating electric motors into the sleds on zip lines and trails where you can actually power people along a path. 
That's super interesting. So you're thinking if 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 we motorize this or put or power power this, could you power a portion of it? Have part of it be open to your uh, under your own steam, and other parts of it where the the ride kind of, or the, the the motor kind of takes over. This is the point in the I, charrette where Vaughn usually tells me I'm nuts. So uh, no, I think <laughs> I think it's it's not me you have to worry about. It's the lawyers. Uh, <laughs> what this, if it becomes it becomes very similar to uh, uh, kind of like an e bike, right, where you have more of a powered assist than something mm. that's fully fully powered. So it may be that you you can keep using your own locomotion, but you get to go a little faster because there is an electric motor that's kind of assisting you in. Oh, or the illusion. Super interesting. And I'd love to be able to do your leap of faith where when you finally get to that, that can be, uh, that can be media. So you could do a combination of real scenery that you're running over, you know, as you, as you sort of go up the, the hill, your your you, your feet may actually be touching the, the the scenery as you go over it, or just above it as you're sort of floating over the rooftops and climbing higher and higher until you get to a big jump, and then maybe that can that motorized winch like actually descend you, down, drop you down for, hmm. into the space, into a big. I, I'm thinking back to you know the the notion of verticality and how important the accuracy of the historic cities are. So before you go off the leap of faith, you really kind of have to give people that like perfect vista from the highest point. So you're going to be able to do some kind of a projection psych. You're going to want to be able to do something like this. I do think you're right that 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 moment of pause before the leap is so important to kind of convey it's that bird like you know moment of being perched and then yep. and the camera flies the courage ahead. before you go for it yeah <laughs> and it, if, and if you're just running because, and you don't have yeah. that pause it won't feel it won't feel quite right since we're motorizing this right you want to be able to like get people <laughs> to jump and then hold that hold that moment like right before the the drop gets severe vertigo is really actually one of the easier sensations to simulate with with media like this so that could be really effective oh and the sure. challenge will be yeah. to do this in a very seamless way um mm. hardware wise is the harness enough does do we need to like orient people's bodies in the sense um that they that they're actually looking up and then falling down how you know how can we how can we make that work so i've been getting super excited about the moments of looking down at rooftops and down at drops below you but you're right at some point you need to look up at a tower and you don't want to have uh, the the track, the overhead track in your view. This is the, the most far out uh, flavor of theme park design where we're designing a brand new prototype ride system. Normally you got to be one of the big boys to do this, but th this is our made up ride. We can do anything we want. So in this, <laughs> in this system, we're talking about maybe some kind of a system where You've got a track, you've got a motorized thing. Maybe there's, uh, you know, sort of a, a rotating arm so you can look with the track or you can look away from it so you can look up, you can look down and it can be running at very controlled motor speeds or it can release its grip on the track and, and descend at gravity speed so you can get some real sense of acceleration. That if it if and, and there's a number of ride systems that sort of get you closer. Is that a bungee setup you're drawing there? Well, I'm just wondering if bungee? if there were two if there were two lines, so there's two tracks, so you don't have the problem of the center track being right above you. We could we could keep the tracks further apart, and that would let you look up and out and give you the vistas. It with, would give you stability, with, right? And, give and you, you actually give you more just stability. program the you program the the tracks further apart or together, which actually causes that sense of rotation and and just speed up speed up one. And slowly yeah, and you, can, you could you could also rotate. get you could also get uh, some up and down by just moving the tracks closer together, right? And, and I was actually just thinking about like the how would you handle doing the drop? You can have the the sleds from the support tracks um, cross over into the next zone, lock that off, and then drop the entire assembly down mm -hmm. to right. recreate the uh, uh, the leap of faith, right? To do the actual fall, right? So yeah. this way you would keep the whole I mean, first least. section of what we were talking about, the agency, the, the walking and, and recording yourself 
until you get to the point where you know you're being motorized um leap of faith is being motorized that, i like that idea i think that's very cool would you uh would you have to end up with a leap of faith or what about you know how would it work for the chickens out there who don't want to do it <laughs> is there another track you want to have branches that respect people's level of engagement you want to you want to give people the opportunity to push into uncomfortable spaces but not force them into them and you always want to mm -hmm. give them an off ramp so i'm always seeing like a chicken a chicken track that people can always find their way to get back to uh an excellent story reason to give people a way out as well right they could just they could opt to follow somebody through the city at the street level instead of mm -hmm. going up the up the rooftop right and that would right. be perfectly plausible without feeling like you're chickening out we don't want to ever like make you feel like you're you're uh You've done something terrible and or, or you're not worthy of, of the the big experience do you how do you feel about introducing this as an element of reward in a theme park could the leap of faith be a reward or would that be would that create you know would too many people be disappointed that they don't get access to it traditionally in theme parks it's been it's all about throughput and trying to get as many people as possible to have the experience as you can can we find ways to make it personal and exclusive and have a own, you know, some, some aspirational, something that only a few people earn. That's a really interesting possibility. What do you guys think about that? So the important bit is to make sure, uh, A, everybody knows that it, that it can be done, that it is a reward mm -hmm. and that it's, and that it's not terribly hard to achieve. Well, it sounds like we've got just a staggering amount of fun stuff to begin with. And this is, by the way, exactly how a first brainstorm goes. We don't necessarily have all of our problems solved, but we've got a lot of great ideas that we can dig into and boil down. So whatever, what's, what, what were the, our favorite things that you heard today, Matilda? You just shout them out and we'll shout out yeah. anything that we uh, I love the idea that we're taking, you know, a, a format of an attraction that is existing and then enhancing it into something that is more groundbreaking. I like the idea that we're exploring verticality because this is key to Assassin's Creed. I like the idea that we're, you know, creating a, a version of a ride that is not necessarily linear. I like that it's physically engaging. Essentially, it's putting you in the shoes of an, what an assassin would do. And if that's not what you want to feel like in the real world for an attraction based on Assassin's Creed, then I don't know what is. So I think just in this process, we automatically gravitated towards what's most important for us in making this ride, which is to capture the physical sensation of, of, of being free and flying through these worlds and the ability to soar like an eagle and to and eventually to deliver the leap of faith, which is undoubtedly how it's got to, it's got, you have to end with that. It has to be the payoff, right? Look but yeah, thank you so much. I, I, you know, I think we've done a great job of capturing the essence of the brand and, and creating something that is new. And that's, that's really exciting for us as a company. So, so yeah. thanks again for, uh, to our, team here at Bizarre to Lex, Vaughn, and Baz on our brainstorming team, to Matilde from Ubisoft, and to all of you for sitting in and joining us. This is our version of storytelling siblings, how we love the connection between the world of games and the world of live attractions. And we hope you'll all come play with us in this world sometime. Thanks all.